Welcome to this online lesson on the Renaissance Big Three. Andreas Vesalius, Ambrose Pare, and William Harvey. These three individuals are the most important significant individuals that you will study as part of the Renaissance stage of this course. Our aims are to know the contributions of three significant individuals and to explain the factors that enabled them to make progress in medicine. Here's a do now task. Galen was a famous Roman doctor and medical genius. If you are not familiar with Galen, there's a part of the medieval course where we have a look at what Galen actually did, even though he was an ancient Roman. So you can look back at that lesson. Let's give him some what went wells and an even better if. So give two things that Galen discovered or developed. Those are what we can call his what went wells. And we can give him one thing that Galen got wrong. We can call that his even better if comment. So note that down. And while you're doing so, you can pause this video. Press play when you're ready to continue. What did we come up with then? Well, Galen discovered lots of things, and many of them were correct. He used more scientific methods like dissection, but he was only able to dissect animals, and that meant that he made some mistakes. Nevertheless, Galen was able to demonstrate that the brain controls the body through the nerves. That was a real breakthrough at a time when people didn't really realise what the function of the brain was, and many people just thought it was there for cooling purposes. What about things he got wrong then? Well, there's several that we could go for. For example, he believed that the blood was used up in the body like a fuel before being replaced with new blood created in the liver. This sort of makes sense, but actually it was entirely wrong. William Harvey, that we'll study later in this lesson, was able to prove this. Renaissance Marvels One of the skills that you'll have to master in the exam is the ability to compare events, individuals and factors to support a conclusion. To get top marks, you need to be able to remember and use multiple examples before coming to an overall conclusion. In the Renaissance, three important individuals use science to back up new ideas and challenging old ones. In fact, there are four significant individuals that we really study as part of the Renaissance course. One of them is Thomas Sydenham, who I've got a different lesson on. However, Vesalius, Pare and Harvey are three which are quite comparable, and that's why we've put them together today. What you will need is a table much like this one here. Take a moment to create one for your own. It needs three sections, one for each of our significant individuals, Vesalius, Pare and Harvey. This is the order that we'll look at them in this lesson. We need a column for their discoveries and achievements. We need a column for how they used scientific methods, other factors that helped as well, even if these were indirect, and also a judgment as to their importance in the history of medicine. That last column is what you'll fill out last once you've considered all the other factors and once you've really studied the information about each person. So if you need to create a table like this, pause the video now while you do so. Press play when you're ready to have a look at our first significant individual. Ready? Let's have a look at Vesalius. Andreas Vesalius, born 1514, died 1564. Andreas Vesalius made great advances in the understanding of anatomy, the structure of the human body, but not necessarily how it works. Before Vesalius, Galen's work on anatomy had been accepted virtually without question. However, Galen was only able to dissect animals and he made several important mistakes. In 1537, Vesalius became professor of medicine at Padua University in Italy. He insisted that his medical students should perform human dissections to better understand how the body worked. Human dissection was still usually illegal, but a local judge gave Vesalius permission to dissect the bodies of executed criminals. He could do this regularly, as execution for criminals was quite common back then. In 1543, Vesalius wrote his book, The Fabric of the Human Body. This contained accurate drawings of the human body drawn by artists. These gave doctors more detailed knowledge of human anatomy based on real human dissections. Using printing technology, this book was widely seen. This meant that the Vesalius had proved some of Galen's work was wrong. He also encouraged others to challenge old ways of thinking. And this is a common theme within the Renaissance, being able to prove and demonstrate live that things were wrong in the past, and therefore helping people to form new ideas and move beyond old mistakes. Here's an example of Vesalius's work. This is the kind of front cover, or rather the inside page of his work, Fabric of the Human Body. There's quite a lot going on in this scene, so it, not, it might not be entirely clear. But what we can see in particular is a central scene with Vesalius looking directly at the reader, 
with an open human body in the middle. This is one of those executed criminals being dissected. Notice how many people are looking around the outside like an audience, almost like an audience in a theatre or an operating theatre, you might say. Indeed, that's the origin of the term, although this is more of a dissection theatre or lecture hall within the university. So we can see there that we've actually got accurate representations of the people and of the body. But the book goes a lot further than this. This is one of the pictures from within the book. There were hundreds of pictures like this within the book. Not only are they wonderful works of art with quite detailed and beautiful landscapes in the background, but they're incredible representations of realistic human bodies. Here we can see that the skin has been removed from this body and it's highlighting various aspects of the musculature and also the ligaments and how that controls the body. So it's quite deliberate that some of the muscles appear to be hanging off. The artist and Vesalius are demonstrating how these things connect together within the body in order to create movement. Before this, it would have not been um, a very possible for anyone to really accurately get an idea of how the muscles work in terms of moving the different limbs of the body. Much as these pictures might seem quite gruesome, they were one of the first really accurate attempts to recreate the human body in this form, rather than just showing the external features of the body. And they're also quite representative of Renaissance art in general. So we can really see here how Andreas Vesalius's work was groundbreaking. Not only that, because these are printed woodcuts, they could be produced in their thousands, reasonably inexpensively compared to hand-drawn manuscripts. So here's your information again. Hopefully by this point you've got your table and you're ready to fill it out. You can pause the video here and review the information and make sure that you've got detailed examples and explanations for each of those sections. And then when you get to the end, you can make your judgment as to how important Vesalius was in the history of medicine. Or, if you prefer, you can wait until you've seen all three of our significant individuals before making up your mind on that one. I'll leave that up to you. Anyway, pause the video now. Done? Let's move on to our next individual. Ambrose Paré. Born 1510, died 1590. That's a pretty good age back then. Paré was a battlefield surgeon who changed the way that wounds were treated despite having no more training than most other barber surgeons of his day. In Paré's career, gunshot wounds became a new challenge for surgeons. The usual way to treat these was by pouring boiling oil into the wound to cauterise it, and in the belief that bullets were actually, in and of themselves, poisonous. And this was a reasonable idea at the time. Actually, what the poison was was more likely to be infection, as the large uh, late medieval and um, renaissance bullets would take pieces of dirty fabric into the wound too. Nice. After one particular battle, Paré had so many wounds to treat that he ran out of the boiling oil that he used to cauterise the wounds. By chance, and out of desperation, he made an ointment of egg yolk, oil of roses, and turpentine that he had read that the Romans had used to treat wounds. It should be said that Pari didn't really have much expectation of this working particularly well. However, the ointment worked. Those treated with it healed more quickly. Pari recommended it to be used in future. He went on to become surgeon to the French royalty. Let's just take a moment to consider why it probably worked. The oil of roses would probably have been a um, good idea as far as Paré was concerned because of its sweet smell. Although we now understand that actually this wouldn't have had much um, medical benefit, it was probably reassuring. The most important part of this is likely to be the turpentine. The turpentine would have been a natural antiseptic. Although this wouldn't have been understood at the time, Paré did recognise that it worked. As for the egg yolk, well that just helped hold the mixture together and make it into a, a sort of a, an ointment that could be placed within the wounds. Egg yolks would have been reasonably sterile as well, so a, a fairly safe uh, ingredient to use without causing further infections, as long as it was very fresh. Anyway, Paré also attempted to reduce the pain and shock of amputations. He used silk threads called ligatures to tie off blood vessels. This actually worked and was better in some respects than cauterisation, which caused its own wounds and very uh, bad pain through, uh, through burning of the blood vessels. However, the death rates got no better as a result of the ligatures. Pare was unaware of how this method actually caused infection through dirt. So he had the right idea, but the execution of it wasn't quite right because of the lack of understanding of what actually causes infection. In 1575, the printing press allowed his book, the collected works of Ambrose Pare, to teach other surgeons his new methods. 
He also pioneered some very early prosthetic or fake limbs, including hands to help disabled amputees. And this was particularly significant because of the number of amputations that were the result of battlefield injuries with the new gunpowder weapons of the age. Anyway, that's the information that you need on Ambrose Pare. You can pause the video here and make your detailed notes on each of the sections of your table. Make sure that you've got comparable detail that you had with Andreas Vesalius. And again, you can either make your judgment about uh, Pare's importance of the history of medicine now, or you can leave it until you've seen the final person, which will be William Harvey in a moment. Anyway, pause the video now, and then we'll be ready to continue once you're done. Okay, ready to move on? Let's go. William Harvey, born 1578, died 1657. William Harvey was an English doctor. He was the personal physician of both James I and Charles I. Both kings encouraged his scientific investigations and were quite interested in them, as were several other kings of this era. This is the Renaissance, after all. Like Vesalius, he was trained at Padua University. Harvey was able to demonstrate and prove the circulation of the blood. This went against Galen's theory that the liver made blood which was used up like a fuel in the muscles. Also like Vesalius, he taught about anatomy. He dissected animals and carried out experiments to prove his ideas. For example, he dissected live frogs. Okay, this is pretty cruel, but it's actually a very clever way of proving his theory. Frogs, when cold, have a very slow heartbeat which allowed Harvey to clearly see the circulation of the blood and demonstrate it. He also showed that blood could only flow in one direction because of valves in the blood vessels. He had proved Galen conclusively wrong, and was able to prove this on live human subjects too, as we'll come to in a moment. In 1628, he was able to publish an anatomical account of the motion of the heart and blood in animals. In this book, he proved that the heart acted like a pump and was responsible for recirculating the blood around the body. Printing allowed the book to be widely shared. Here's what we mean about Harvey's valve experiment. As we can see here, what the uh, experiment is showing is that a tensed um, arm, which is holding a rod and has a tourniquet attached to it, will allow the blood vessels to stand out underneath the skin. By drawing the finger along one of the blood vessels to one of the bulges, which are actually the valves, and then letting go, because the blood flow is restricted by the tourniquet, the blood won't automatically flow back through there, and so therefore he's showing that these are valves that only allow the blood to go in one particular di direction. This helped to prove that his blood circulation theories were not just true of amphibians like frogs, but also applied to real human subjects. And mercifully, once the tourniquet was removed, this person would have not been in any discomfort. So there's your information on William Harvey once again. Make any notes that you need to, again trying to keep it comparable to the amount of information that you've included for the others. And by this point you might be in a position to be ready to decide which of these three important individuals was the most significant in medical history. And when we're talking about their importance in terms of medical history, we've got to consider them within wider context. Are they deciding or on uh, creating new things which are really useful? Or are they actually contributing ideas which overturn very long-held and wrong ideas from earlier in history? Whatever judgment you make, make sure that you can back it up with examples of what these people actually contributed. Pause the video now while you complete your notes on William Harvey and while you complete your section on their importance in medical history. Finished? Okay, let's begin to apply this. So let's consider factors for success. Review the information that you have gathered so far. If you don't have enough to complete these next tasks, you will need to go back and do some more or perhaps perform some wider reading. Firstly then, explain which of the big three was helped by each of these factors, chance and luck, new technology, and support from influential people. Secondly, in your view, who made the biggest advances in medical understanding? Explain why with at least two specific examples of their work. And lastly, did the work of Vesalius, Pare and Harvey improve health, not just medical understanding? Explain your view, whatever it is. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. You'll probably want to spend between 15 and 20 minutes on that, maybe a little bit longer. Afterwards, we'll have a look at some potential answers. Although these won't be complete, they'll just be designed to help you add to anything that you might have missed. So pause the video while you complete these tasks. Hopefully you've accessed that fine. 
Let's have a look at some things that you might want to add or that you might have missed. Time to improve your work. You might want to use a separate colour for this. So firstly, which of the big three was helped by each of these factors? Firstly, chance and luck. Pare is the big one here because he ran out of oil by chance, although we should remember that it took his inspiration and his memory of the old Roman technique in order to be able to make, turn that into his advantage and create a new and successful treatment. New technology actually helped them all. All of these people published their work using printing. Also, Vesalius used new art techniques in his book, but also used uh, new and more accurate woodcut printing techniques to produce accurate drawings. Pare also used ligatures and dealt with gunshot wounds. The production of ligatures was fairly new technology, but in particular, it was the introduction of gunpowder weapons that produced the need for new treatments, and therefore, in a respect, new technology did lead to advances, albeit indirectly. Lastly, support from influential people. All of them had support. Pare had the support of the French kings. Vesalius was supported by Padua's judge, who supplied the criminals' dead bodies to him. And Harvey was encouraged by both James I and Charles I. Because the king encouraged these people, and because the king recognised their work in each of their countries, this made it more easy for other people to accept their work and to allow them to overturn old and incorrect ideas. Lastly then, did the work of Vesalius, Pare and Harvey improve health? Well, not really. Their expertise improved some surgical techniques or focused on understanding of anatomy or the structure of the body and how it's put together. They didn't make progress on how and why people became ill or how to treat them when they became ill. Consider Pare, for example. His ligatures did not help death rates after surgery because of the risk of infection. He had no knowledge of what actually caused infection and therefore no way of actually preventing it. And he never made that connection either. Let's imagine that you've got another row on your table. By all means, you could add one or you could just use this as more of a thinking activity. Let's consider what we would say for each of these different sections for Galen. But remember, he was a, an ancient Roman and not a Renaissance figure. Instead, it's his work that much of the Renaissance is correcting or adding to. Your task then. Compare Galen's information to that of Vesalius. Do you think that Vesalius was more or less important than Galen? Use at least one explained example and one explained comparison to back up your opinion. You might structure it like this. Galen believed that, however, Vesalius proved that. This makes either Galen or Vesalius more important because. So let's consider Galen's achievements and discoveries. Think about all the work that he did on the human anatomy, his work with the pig experiment showing that the brain controls the body through the nerves, for example. Think about Galen's experimentation, as I've just mentioned. That's an example of how he used scientific means and other factors that may have helped him. Remember that he too was supported by influential people like the Caesars. And it's important in the history of medicine being that his ideas were sometimes correct, but more importantly, they lasted for thousands of years, even when they were incorrect. Pause the video here while you consider those comparisons. So what did we think? Well, on the one hand, Galen is incredibly important because he provided the foundation that Vesalius was working from. However, arguably Vesalius got more correct, and that makes him incredibly important. But remember, importance in the history of medicine is not necessarily just making things better. It's about having an effect. And in perhaps in that respect, Galen's effect having lasted for so many centuries and having got some things correct right the way back in Roman times shows that he has the longer term more significance. But of course, Vesalius was able to correct many of his mistakes, so he's really important too. As long as you've backed it up correctly, you should be fine. So, let's just review Galen's information. He proved that the brain controls the body through the nerves. He developed the theory of opposites. He suggested that the heart pumped blood, which was used up like a fuel. He dissected animals to make his discoveries. He experimented on a pig to prove his nerve theory. But he also hindered things. Religion didn't allow him to dissect uh, uh, humans, so actually that meant that he got some things wrong. But some things helped him. Science and animal dissection allowed him to prove some of his, feeling, his uh, theories. And his importance was really big. His ideas lasted for thousands of years, and some of what he discovered he got right. However, some wrong ideas went unchallenged for a very long time. The length of time his ideas lasted till, still makes him important, even if he was wrong sometimes. Now I've completed the information on the screen, you can pause it here and make some improvements if you need to. So 
So how much progress was there in medicine in the Renaissance? This can be shown on a graph like this. By all means draw one now. A standard A4 sized piece of paper should be sufficient for this. And again, it's not as if we have to draw this to exact scale, it's more a demonstration rather than a timeline. Our y-axis, this one here, represents the amount of progress that there was. And here are a series of different periods. The ones for our course that are most important are the medieval and the renaissance periods. However, I've included others to show that there was different, different types of progress and regress at various times. We could plot it like this, very slow progress through prehistory, a bit more progress through Egyptian times as understanding of dissections was improved by the process of mummification. Then the work of Hippocrates, which is important within our course because it provides a foundation for a lot of medieval ideas, we made uh, even more progress. And this was carried on by the likes of Galen. Although he was a Roman, he's also important for much of what we've uh, looked at in terms of the foundations of medieval ideas. But then there's a significant amount of regress too, particularly with public health in what is called the Dark Ages, when so much many written, written records were simply lost. Then we've got very slow progress in medieval times as some of the old ideas are discovered. But what happens in the Renaissance? As a revision task, you could create your own graph like this. But I just want you to think now, where would you plot the line of progress for the Renaissance? Would it be going up more steeply than medieval times or carrying on in more or less the same way? If it's carrying on in the same way, really that shows there was lots of continuity. If there's very steep um, uh, progress and the line goes up a lot, that shows that there's a lot of change and it's changed for the better. Your task then, study the graph. How much progress do you think was made in the Renaissance compared to earlier periods? As much as the Romans? More? Less? Whatever you think, explain. Secondly, how much progress had there been in the Renaissance? Had medical progress gone beyond Roman achievements? If so, in all areas, or just some? If it has gone beyond Roman experience, then your line should be well above that peak where the Roman period ended and the Dark Ages begins. Don't spend too long drawing this graph. Like I say, it's more a demonstration rather than an accurate timeline. But you could pause the video here and either answer those questions in relation to the graph that you see on the screen or create your own. It's up to you. Let's move on to our final task. We're going to do an exam style question now. This is one of the, lo the longer types of answer that you will have to do. It starts with a hypothesis or a statement. Andreas Vesalius did more to advance medical understanding than either Ambrose Pare or William Harvey. How far do you agree with this view? Explain your answer. Now at a basic level, you can either agree with that because you think Vesalius did do more than the other two, or you could disagree with it and suggest that either William Harvey or Ambrose Pare did more than Vesalius. But in terms of how far, you could either say to an extent, to a large extent, to a small extent, whatever. So it is really important within your answer here that you show an idea of your understanding of extent because all of these people um, made some progress, but you need to decide to what extent you idea with that particular opinion that's been put forward. With these longer 16 mark answers within the exam, you will be given some stimulus points to help you out. So the exam answer would say, or the exam question rather would say, you may use the following in your answer. Circulation of the blood, remember who that relates to, and support from influential people. Think about the influential people who supported each of these big three individuals. You must also use information of your own. Here's how to answer. Use Peel paragraphs for your first argument. Peel stands for point, example, explain and link. Here's how it might be structured. Remember, you don't actually need to write the headings point, example, explain and link. So in some ways, Vesalius was significant. An example of this was, so give some specific examples of what made him significant, and then explain the effect of this was or this involved, and then you link it back to the question. Remember, we're supposed to be either agreeing or disagreeing with that statement that Vesalius was more important than the others. So you could say this supports the view that Vesalius, was an, a, that Vesalius advanced medicine more than the others because. Then you can actually evaluate it. This is a bit of a trickier skill. When you evaluate, you've got to kind of uh, decide how much you agree with that particular point of view. So however, I either agree, agree or disagree with this view because, and you can link this back to the answer. So if you really disagree with that statement and you've just spent some time explaining how amazing Vesalius was, here you can undermine that a little bit by saying, well, okay, he did do some really good stuff, but this is why I don't think he was really all that. 
You then need to do your counter argument and you use the same structure again. Point, example, explain and link. So you carry on very much as above. Remember, you don't have to use these writing frames, but you may find them helpful if you struggle a bit with structuring longer answers. Then, lastly, you need to conclude. Overall, you will agree or disagree to an extent, a large extent, a small extent, whatever you think. And then you support that with, with examples that you've already used and by comparing these different individuals. And remember, you're considering their importance in the history of medicine. So who has the biggest um, uh, different examples of progress? and whose examples of progress are either most significant or last longest. There's various ways that you can look at this. These answers are tricky. You should aim to spend about half an hour on this, including some time uh, planning it out. If you write down some bullet pointed notes of exactly what you want to include, you can tick them off as you go along, but don't cross them out. Remember, any plan that you write in the exam can still be marked if you make other mistakes. The only way reason an examiner won't mark your work is if you actually do deliberately cross it out. And it would be a real shame to lose some very easy marks if you, for example, ran out of time. So pause the video here and spend around about half an hour answering this question, unless you're entitled to extra time in the exam. How did you get on? Hopefully your hands are aching now because you've written pages and pages of work. I'm going to show you an example answer now. I'm not saying that this is perfect, but it is one way that you might answer this question, even if you disagree with the view that I put forward here. OK, as this is a long answer, there's a lot of text that's going to appear upon the screen here. If it looks a bit blurry, consider switching to the HD version if you're not watching that already and possibly switch to full screen. I'm going to highlight where I've made my point, example, explain and link and my evaluate parts with these colours. So points will be in red, examples in blue, explain, explanations will be in green, my links back to the question will be in purple and where I have, I have evaluated, I've put that in black. So let's have a look at my first section. In some ways, Vesalius was very significant in bringing medical progress. For example, Vesalius was able to use human dissection to learn more about the body. Before Vesalius, human dissections were rare. This meant that many of the mistakes Galen had made from dissecting animals were repeated and not challenged. This supports the view that, Galen, that Vesalius rather, was more significant than Pari and Harvey because both of them would have benefited from the earlier anatomical work by Vesalius. Notice that I brought an element of chronology in here too. Vesalius was around and working before both Pari and Harvey, and so that's an important thing to consider when we're looking at causation. On to my next bit. Another example that Vesalius was able to share his ideas widely. Uh, his book, Fabric of the Human Body, was widely read by others with an interest in medical science. This supports the view that Vesalius was more important than Pare and Harvey, as Pare is known to have gained much knowledge from reading books rather than through university training, and Harvey studied at Padua University some years after Vesalius worked there. However, despite these examples of importance, Vesalius and his work did little to improve health. He also did little in terms of practical treatment, as his work was largely focused on building an understanding of anatomy. So I've included a little bit of evaluation there where I consider some of the limitations of Vesalius' work. Notice too that I haven't just stuck to one example. There were a total of six marks up for grabs in this question for your knowledge, although the majority of it, ten marks, will be based upon your analysis and how well you explain that knowledge and its importance in relation to the question. Remember that with the stimulus points you've got to go beyond what is offered in the question, otherwise you cannot get all six marks for your knowledge. But I think I've put forward my first part of the argument pretty well. Now I move on to the counter argument. On the other hand, Pare and Harvey made significant progress too. For example, Pare made advances in the field of surgery by changing the treatment of gunshot wounds and using ligatures. This resulted in more effective treatments and he also published his work in a book. This challenges the view that Vesalius was more important as Vesalius made little direct progress in surgery. That said, unlike Vesalius, Pare was not highly respected as a barber surgeon and his work was published in French and not Latin, limiting how many academics actually read it. OK, so again, there's an element of um, evaluation in this part here. Notice some of the other key phrases I'm using too. Things like, on the other hand, showing to the um, examiner that I'm really considering the counter argument here and looking, using phrases like this challenges the view to link back to the question because we know what the view is it's in the question but we're saying whether things are agreeing with that and backing it up or whether they're going against let's move on to my next part of the counter argument william harvey also demonstrated that blood circulates in the body he used experiments such as live frogs to demonstrate this theory 
His ch this challenges the view that Vesalius was most important, as Vesalius' work was mostly concerned with how the body was structured, not how organs like the heart worked. However, Harvey's artistic diagrams and accurate anatomical drawings were likely influenced by the earlier work of Vesalius. So, so far, I've got both sides of the argument here. I now need to make sure that I'm absolutely clear on which side I support and whether I agree with the statement in the question or whether I disagree. And that's where we come on to our conclusion. Again, point example, explain and link and an evaluation within my conclusion. In conclusion, I agree that Vesalius was more important than Har Paré and Harvey to a fairly limited extent. Harvey and Paré made significant advances in physiology and surgery that Vesalius didn't make. However, their work was later than Vesalius and would probably have drawn on Vesalius and his work in the Fabric of the Human Body book. This supports the view that Vesalius was most significant as it is possible that Paré and Harvey's work was at least in part made possible by Vesalius. Paré and Harvey were important too. But Vesalius began a new approach to studying the human body that they were able to build upon. Now the question was asking me to what extent, and I've said that actually I can see both sides here were really, really important, and so that I agree to a fairly limited extent rather than saying yes, I absolutely outright agree with Vesalius. But I am still making that judgment. I'm still explaining that I agree with Vesalius at uh, the point that Vesalius was most important, but not overwhelmingly. It's to a fairly limited extent. Here on this screen, we can see the entire answer put together. And yes, that is a lot of work with some very small text. So again, full screen would be your best bet here, as would HD. But if you want to make some improvements to your own work, then this is an excellent opportunity to do so. So pause the video here if you want to do that and steal some of my ideas. Let's move on to the last bit. Finally, three questions. Ligatures new technology in printing, and live frogs. If you have understood this lesson, you should be able to write three questions to which the above would be the answer. If you're able to do that, great. You've probably got what you need. If you're unable to do that, it'll be well worth reviewing some of the knowledge that we've covered in this lesson. You can pause the video while you do that. If not, this is the end of the lesson. I'll say thanks for watching. I hope it's been useful. And if it has, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, good health.